Scientists keep finding new planets they call super-Earths. It's a class of more massive planets than Earth, but way lighter than ice giants, such as Uranus and Neptune. Super-Earths can be made of rock, gas, or a combination of these two. They are often twice or even up to 10 times bigger than the Earth. They're interesting to study, but kind of too far away from us. They're pretty common outside of our solar system, together with other interesting planets like mini Neptunes. Those can also be gas dwarfs, ice giants, or huge rocky bodies. But again, we don't have anything like that. But something we do have that those other solar systems don't? Jupiter. It's the biggest and heaviest object that orbits our sun. This king of planets possesses a powerful force to dominate our solar system. Jupiter is notorious for eating planets. A protoplanet slammed into it about 4.5 billion years ago, when Jupiter was still a young planet in its early stages. This protoplanet was 10 times heavier than Earth and was made of ice and rock. The collision was huge, Jupiter's core broke apart, and helium and hydrogen mixed with denser materials. Through time, the heavy material settled back into the dense core, which is what we see today. And if it swallowed a planet before, it might keep doing it as well. We suspect our solar system used to have many more large planets than it has now. For example, it's kind of empty around Mercury today. Similar areas around many other central stars are definitely more packed with intermediate mass planets with the size between Earth and Neptune. Our solar system was a chaotic place at its beginnings. Young stars were surrounded by swirling disks of dust and gas, and planets would form out of that debris, something like trees when they're springing up from the ground. Small rocky planets would form in the strong heat and light close to stars, while gas giants would form farther out, where temperatures were lower, which means they could preserve more gassy materials. And even though planets in our solar system seem pretty stable and peaceful today, following their orbit, they weren't that calm before. Some planets didn't have a circular orbit. They had oblong, more eccentric paths. It took them swinging first toward their stars and then farther away. It was like they had been thrown off kilter by the gravity of other planets on their way. There's something called the Grand Tack Theory. It explains things happening in the first few million years when our solar system was forming. At some point, Jupiter, one of the key players here, may have been pulled in closer by our central star. After that, it went back and took a huge cloud of debris. It was like a sailboat when it tacks around a buoy. This kind of messed with planets that were in the process of formation. After Saturn was fully formed, our close neighbors in the solar system cleared out a little. But if the idea about Grand Tack is correct, Jupiter had grabbed everything in its way, and its migrations had caused more collisions in this area. Jupiter might have delivered some of the water that now fills the oceans we have on our planet. It shepherds plenty of asteroids. From time to time, it sends some whizzing into interstellar space or amongst the planets in our solar system. It may have even taken part in the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago. When the huge space rock hit the Earth, it left a crater off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It all caused earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis that made a huge impact on all animal and plant life on Earth. No one knows where it came from. We're not even sure if it was an asteroid or a comet. One theory says it may have been a comet that came from the Oort cloud, which is made of icy debris and is located somewhere at the edge of our solar system. It could have been bumped off course by Jupiter and its powerful gravitational force. This way, our solar system was like a pinball machine, where Jupiter, the biggest planet, kicks incoming comets into orbits that send them closer to the Sun. When these comets are near the Sun, they can go through strong tidal forces that break them apart and eventually create shrapnel-like pieces of a comet. That event was a point when our mammalian ancestors started to rule. That means without Jupiter, there might not be us either, nor the Earth. It seemed like our biggest planet came swinging in, destroyed older planets, and cleared the way for smaller worlds like ours. Jupiter may have been the reason why we can't find Planet 9 right now. Scientists believe it exists, and they think it could be hiding somewhere beyond Neptune, but not Pluto. There are three zones in our solar system, 
the inner planets, outer planets, and whatever there is beyond. The mysterious planet could be the size of the Earth or Mars. It swirled among the gas giants before they eventually swept it toward the outer parts of our solar system, or even somewhere into deep space. Jupiter has stripes because of differences in temperature, atmospheric gas, and chemical composition. Scientists used to think the only reason for these different colors was the mighty atmospheric wind and materials circulating between layers of the atmosphere. Now we know the light-colored stripes, or so-called zones, show us where the gas rises. When the stripes are dark-colored, they're called belts and can tell us where gas is sinking. Jupiter's moons could also be why the planet is stripy, because they're tugging on its atmospheric convection cells. At the center of Jupiter, there's a dense liquid core made of helium and metallic hydrogen, together with dissolved heavier elements. As we go further from its center, the temperature and pressure inside the planet drop off. That way, the liquid interior gives way to gases from the atmosphere. Again, mostly helium and hydrogen. No one knows how deep this liquid gas boundary lies, but the planet is probably fully liquid a couple of thousand miles under its cloud tops. Jupiter would still be bigger than some other giants, like Saturn, if we could strip its gases. Jupiter is sometimes even called a failed star, although that's not quite correct. It's mostly made of hydrogen, like regular stars, but it's still not massive enough to start thermonuclear reactions in its core, which would eventually turn it into a real star. In theory, every object could be turned into a star if you only add enough matter to it. If there's enough mass, the temperature and internal pressure will increase and start thermonuclear reactions. So, to turn Jupiter into a star, such as the Sun, you'd have to make it 1,000 times more massive. But to form a cooler red dwarf, you'd only need 80 Jupiter masses more. That way, Jupiter won't spontaneously become a new star of our solar system. But if many space objects with similar mass collide with it, or in other words, if Jupiter eats them, then maybe, <laughs> you never know. But in theory, if it could become a massive star, it would have stopped other planets from forming in stable orbits. It would have also increased the radiation that the surface of those planets get, which is why it would be really hard for life to develop in our solar system. Jupiter is the planet that spins the fastest in our solar system. It only needs 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis. Even though it's huge, more than 300 times bigger than the Earth, and 2.5 times more massive than the rest of the planets in our entire solar system together. But if it got more massive, it would shrink. More mass would make Jupiter denser, which means it would begin pulling in on itself. So it could get four times its mass and would still be the same size. Uh-oh, hurricane alert. Everyone's hiding. The speed of the wind outside is more than 75 miles per hour. Seems like a lot. But this storm is moving at 400 miles per hour. Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but to see a storm that fast, you'll have to travel to Jupiter. So let the journey begin. The planet is huge. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this gas giant. It's also incredibly hot, with the temperatures reaching about 43,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the planet's core. Unfortunately, you can't land on Jupiter's surface because, well, being a gas giant, it doesn't have any solid surface. But you can go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. Look at these thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. They're what make the planet look colorful and kind of striped. If you continue descending toward the center of the planet, you'll see its atmosphere, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, becoming liquid. It happens because of immense atmospheric pressure. The planet's core itself is a mysterious object. Scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a molten ball of thick liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Anyway, exploring Jupiter isn't the main goal of your trip. No, you've arrived here to see the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is 1.3 times wider than our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm goes more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. 
that's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat reached 2,400 degrees. This temperature is higher than that of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear entirely. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The change in the wind speed is no more than 1.5 miles per hour during one Earth year. It's a tiny change, but however small the difference is, it still means a lot. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. It's unclear what fuels the storm. Can it be the nature of the storm's home planet? Since it's a gas giant, Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, so there's no friction which might be the only thing that could make the storm weaken. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, swirling. Just like on our home planet, where cooler and warmer air mix and merge into one another, forming giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms could have come together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps going by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, the storm might be absorbing other smaller vortices. This makes the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow astronomers to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Scientists have been speculating on what may hide beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Is it a massive volcano? Eh, Unlikely. Jupiter is mostly made up of gases, and it doesn't have a crust that could crack, letting lava escape from the planet's interior. There are also a few theories explaining why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to bright orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies deep below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of gas might be reacting to the UV radiation coming from the sun. This is probably what gives the storm its red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Hey, your guess is as good as mine, huh? Jupiter isn't the only planet that can boast having a giant storm. Another one, as wide as our home planet, rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. How clever! The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so. The storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it starts stretching and stretching. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the top of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White Spot is where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal source of heat that can power the winds. Anyway, severe storms on different planets of the solar system aren't the only space mystery that makes astronomers scratch their heads. Let's move to Pluto, the largest known dwarf planet in the solar system, and explore its atmosphere. It rises really high above the surface of the planet and has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. By the way, our moon also has some sort of an atmosphere. Called an exosphere, it consists of helium, neon, and argon. 
is 10 trillion times less dense than Earth's atmosphere. While traveling through space, watch out for black holes! Woo! A black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. But black holes can sometimes behave like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, they flare up. Sounds like me. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy. And this phenomenon leaves gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater this event left behind could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, I can't get my head around that either. During your space voyage, think twice before landing on unknown planets. Otherwise, you may end up in a place like K2-141b. That's a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate, form clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, it rains rocks. The surface of this exoplanet is covered with lava seas dozens of miles deep. The temperatures on the K2-141b reach 5,000 degrees during the day. That's toasty enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of 1 mile per second, carry this rock vapor into the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky rain. Uh Uh-uh, not a vacation spot. Too hot. I'll pass. Bang! Another hit on Jupiter. Hmm, let's see. Gas giant, the largest planet in the solar system, 318 times bigger than the Earth, two and a half times bigger than the rest of the planets in the solar system put together. One more interesting thing. If it got any bigger, it would actually become smaller. You see, with more mass, the planet would be denser. That would cause Jupiter to start pulling in on itself. Scientists say Jupiter could have four times greater mass, but still keep the same size. It takes 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis. It's the fastest spinning planet in our solar system and gets hit by so many space objects all the time. This was discovered by amateur astronomers observing Jupiter and saw some unusual flash at the planet's surface. Impact events cause flashes like that, and for some reason, Jupiter gets more impacts than other planets. In 1994, astronomers discovered Shoemaker-Levy 9, a comet that broke apart and collided with the gas giant. The original comet was approximately the size of one that erased the dinosaurs. However, this asteroid fell apart into more than 20 fragments. They darkened the planet's surface, and it remained like that for months. Fifteen years later, in 2009, astronomers saw a black spot on Jupiter the size of Earth. It was the result of an asteroid around 650 to 1650 feet in length. The biggest asteroid recorded on Earth hit the area of Tunguska, Russia in 1908. This caused a massive explosion, even though no one ever found a crater. So why is Jupiter the target for so many space objects? Asteroids and comets that pass by Earth and Jupiter go almost at the same speed. The number density of the space object that may interact is almost the same too. But the cross-section of what they might hit is very different. Jupiter has 11 times the diameter of our planet, which means it has around 125 times the cross-section. The more massive some planet is, the stronger its gravitational attraction. So it will entice some space objects drifting by. Our gravitational field is weaker than Jupiter's. If some object passes near us moving at a speed of 22,300 miles per hour or less, our gravitation will attract it. Asteroids and comets usually move at bigger speeds. Jupiter attracts most of the comets and asteroids passing by. If our planet was hit by such big objects as frequently as Jupiter, we'd have extinction like with dinosaurs thousands of times more often. In 2020, scientists found there was an unusual asteroid in the orbit of Venus, the first one there. The size of a small mountain and rich in minerals we can find in Earth's deep rocks. They even think it could be a clue to a bigger set of asteroids created when our solar system was forming. That's not the only mystery around Venus. The planet has insanely violent winds that drive clouds and storms around the planet at speeds greater than 220 miles per hour. That's 60 times faster than Venus itself rotates. 
Also, scientists are still not sure what happened with its oceans. They believe since the planet is so close to the sun, the water evaporated and went into the atmosphere as steam. It trapped heat coming from the sun, heat that would have vaporized more and more water over time. Venus probably had an environment like on Earth, but a very long time ago. The theory says many comets and asteroids were slamming into Venus. Billions of the planet's pieces were flying all around. Some may have even crashed into Earth's moon. Pieces that slammed into our planet are probably buried very deep, since we have greater geological activity than the moon. Uranus also had a collision, but a more serious one than asteroids. The rest of the planets in our solar system mostly have an axis of rotation that kind of points up from the elliptical plane. Uranus is tilted, lying on the side. So a season there lasts 42 years, when either its south or the north pole is pointed at the sun. Most of the planets also rotate counterclockwise when you see them from above our solar system. Venus does the opposite, which means maybe it was kicked off axis a long time ago. Uranus may have collided with the other space body millions of years ago. When our solar system was still very young, the orbital configuration of Saturn and Jupiter may have crossed. Their gravitational forces kind of created orbital momentum and transferred it to Uranus. That knocked it off axis. Millions of asteroids orbit the Sun, and not so many pass by Earth from time to time. So we don't have some dangerous space bodies coming toward us. The plan is to visit Mars in the 2030s. And scientists hope Mars won't be a target of some bigger space bodies. New craters are formed on the red planet every one to two days. They can be 13 feet across, which means they could have been formed by objects that are the size of a soccer ball. Since the atmosphere there is thinner than ours, smaller bodies can enter easier. Most of the Martian north is smooth lowlands. The south is higher, full of craters, and the planet's interior has a surprising amount of rare metals. The theory says this is because a big celestial body collided with Mars and tore away a part of its northern half. Debris from that asteroid circled the planet and then mixed into two small moons that orbit Mars. We also have some Mars rocks on Earth, found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and some other places across the globe. Some of these rocks have gas that's chemically the same as the atmosphere on Mars. Rocks probably came due to a big explosion that happened when some larger asteroid or meteor that was ejected from Mars and landed on our planet. Mercury also has a thin atmosphere, so there are many smaller strikes there. Imagine waking up, going to your window, and see there are micrometeor showers every morning, which is something that happens on Mercury. This strange weather pattern shapes its atmosphere, called an exosphere. Mercury is so dense, its heavy iron core accounts for two-thirds of its total mass. Scientists think it could have been bigger in the past, but many collisions got the surface sort of scraped off. It's been constantly bombarded by rocks from space that left marks with craters. Planes on its surface seem to have been created because of volcanic lava spilling over the surface and then dried smooth. Many craters are filled with such a material, which means there's one more thing that rocked Mercury's world – volcanoes. There's an unusual group of asteroids discovered near Neptune. Wide range in sizes, from big metropolitan areas to tiny pebbles. They are thought to come from an asteroid group called the Kuiper Belt. It makes a ring well beyond Neptune. But these new asteroids have different colors than the Kuiper Belt. They're so far away from the Sun, their surface was supposed to stay almost pristine but they have a similar color to those sun-baked asteroids around Jupiter. Like the rest of the planets, Neptune gets heat from the sun. But there's something mysterious inside the planet that makes it generate more heat than it gets. This affects its weather, and Neptune has the weirdest weather in the whole solar system. Massive storms, insanely high winds, cirrus-like clouds that rapidly change all the time. There are dark spots in its atmosphere. They come and go. We receive a thousand times more sunlight than Neptune. Gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter can protect our planet from asteroids. Without them, the big impacts that created enough debris to form both moons and other planets would happen more often. There's a huge asteroid going around Saturn, which could be a potential flyby by 2031, more than 10 times bigger than the asteroid that erased the dinosaurs. Titan, one of the moons orbiting Saturn, 80% more massive than our moon, is actually the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. It's one and a half times thicker than ours and consists mainly of nitrogen, like our atmosphere. No one knows where all that nitrogen came from. 
However, unlike Saturn and most of the other places in our solar system, its moon has a real potential to host life. You're standing in a room full of explosive gas. One spark could cause an explosion so powerful that all the windows and doors would be just blown out with a huge column of fire. And you're holding a match. You need a bigger target than this room. How about the largest room of explosive gas in our entire solar system? Meet Jupiter. It's the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest one in our system. It's 11 times the width of Earth and almost two and a half times heavier than all the other planets in our solar system combined. If we put Jupiter on the scales, we would need about 317 Earths to balance it. But most importantly, it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It's the gas we use in our kitchen or fill up our car with, and it burns just fine. More importantly, there's metallic hydrogen. In its normal state, Hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe, but on Jupiter, it's at great pressure, more than 400 million atmospheres. By comparison, on Earth, you feel the pressure of one atmosphere. So multiply that by 400 million, and hydrogen is compressed so much that it looks like liquid metal. Metallic hydrogen can be a great fuel. It'll give off 20 times more energy than burning ordinary hydrogen. So you and your match can have great fun out there. Okay, here we go. The first problem is distance. Jupiter is only one planet away from us, but the path is also blocked by the asteroid belt behind Mars. It's full of giant rock debris. On average, each asteroid could be as wide as the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. There's rocks the size of an entire state. And the biggest asteroid of them all is Ceres. It's almost as wide as Alaska. It's even considered a dwarf planet. And this dangerous journey to Jupiter takes about 650 days. That's almost two years of boredom inside a spaceship. By comparison, the longest time astronauts have spent aboard a spaceship is 84 days. But we'll let you take your favorite DVD collection and a couple bags of popcorn. At the end of the day, you'll be able to get some sleep after a hard day at work. Fast forward two years into the future, and you've arrived at your destination. You're already imagining lighting a match at the surface of Jupiter, exploding it like a balloon. Oh, be careful when you get close to it. Because of Jupiter's great weight, it has a strong gravitational force, about three times stronger than back home on Earth. The closer you get to its surface, the weaker you feel, and you can even barely stand on your feet. The maximum weight you can lift here is also three times less and even a match you're holding in your hand already feels heavier. If you try to jump up, you need more effort. Actually, you can't even do that because Jupiter is a gas giant. That means it has no solid surface. Theoretically, the deeper you dive into these clouds, the more pressure you'll feel. Gradually, the clouds and gases thicken and form a kind of liquid. But you don't have to dive that deep. Methane is a light gas, and it's closer to the surface. So, this is the moment of truth. You take a match, you flick it on the box, and nothing happens. Well, let's give it a couple more tries. Second match. Third. Ugh, nothing works. Okay, you've got a gas burner in your backpack. You unscrew the valve to maximum, and nothing happens again. Well, that's because it takes three components to start the combustion process. The first is fuel. Luckily, there's enough methane and metallic hydrogen on Jupiter to blow up the whole planet in a matter of seconds. The second component is the ignition source. It's the initial force that will start the combustion process. It could be a spark, an electrical discharge, or a match like the one you have in your hand. And the last ingredient is oxygen. Yes, the same oxygen that we breathe. It's just as important to fire as the fuel itself. For an experiment, try lighting a small candle. Now cover it with a glass. You see how the fire keeps burning for a few seconds and then goes out? The fuel is still there, but the fire has used up all the oxygen inside the glass and the burning process is over. The same thing happens on Jupiter. There just can't be fire simply because there's no oxygen. And you didn't even have to fly there to find that out. From Earth, we can see hundreds of thousands of little meteorites falling on Jupiter. 
The asteroid belt next to it is to blame for this. When they hit its atmosphere, they start to burn. And that doesn't instantly blow up the entire planet. But don't be upset. There's still a way to ignite this gas giant planet. All you have to do is trigger a thermonuclear chain reaction on the planet. Then, there'll be an explosion so powerful, it'll be visible from Earth. And it will be like the birth of a new star. To do that, we need to detonate a nuclear reactor, like the ones that give us electricity here on Earth. In fact, we'd have to send everything we have to Jupiter. But even that won't do the trick. Big asteroids, when they hit the planet, cause a much bigger explosion. In 2009, a meteorite the size of five soccer fields hit Jupiter. It caused an explosion of five billion tons of TNT. This incident left a dark spot the size of the Pacific Ocean. And an even bigger explosion happened there in 1994. After that collision, there was a giant spot on Jupiter almost the size of our planet. But strong winds and storms quickly began to sweep away the traces of the explosion. After a few weeks, Jupiter looked like normal. The problem is that our attempts to blow up the gas giant took place on the planet's surface. We need to plant a charge the size of the moon deep below. A massive explosion will cause a thermonuclear reaction and cause the metallic hydrogen to detonate. The explosive process is set, and within seconds, Jupiter explodes like a giant balloon. But this spectacle will be the last one that humanity ever sees. The explosion would disturb the stable orbits of Earth and the other planets. The trajectory of Earth around the Sun might change, and we may see the dawn not in the east, but on any other side of the world. When the strong wind from the explosion reaches the Earth, it'll start scraping our atmosphere. Soon, our planet will lose its ozone layer. It was our shield that protected us from solar radiation. In such a situation, we'll have to hide underground for the rest of our lives. But even this can't protect us. Before long, the Earth will be showered with thousands of meteorites. Jupiter was so heavy that it held the asteroid belt in place. Without it, the asteroids would start flying towards us. Earth would feel a constant meteor shower. But there would be no one left on Earth to observe it anymore. Jupiter's explosion can be compared to a supernova. In fact, Jupiter is practically a star. If it were just a little bigger and heavier, it would start to shrink. The intense pressure on the planet's core would start thermonuclear reactions. Eventually, Jupiter will have turned into a brown dwarf. And it would be 50 times heavier than it is now. But because it doesn't have enough weight to do that, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star. Well, maybe we should visit other gas planets in our solar system and try to light our match there. Saturn. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter, but there's no oxygen for combustion there either. So all you have to do is admire the planet's beautiful rings and move on. Well, Uranus and Neptune are much smaller, and they don't have metallic hydrogen, so their explosion wouldn't be as strong. But you still wouldn't be able to ignite them with a match, because there's no atmosphere full of oxygen. But there is one planet where you could light a fire with your match, it's GJ1132b, and it's 39 light years away. Scientists think it might have oxygen on it, although it's not a gas giant that has combustible gases in its atmosphere. But you can still sit on its rocky ground and make a fire to admire the unusual sunset. Jupiter's gravity shattered a huge comet. It wasn't enough for the space monster. A real catastrophe happened. The shards didn't fly in different directions. They lined up and rushed towards Jupiter like the rail cars of a train. 21 fragments up to one mile in diameter burst through Jupiter's atmosphere. Fireballs at the speed of 37 miles per second bombarded the planet's shell. They heated the space around them to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's higher than the temperature in the sun's upper atmosphere and 312 times hotter than you need to boil an egg. Well, I'm not hungry anymore. The impact was like from a rock falling into a pond. The meteorite fragments formed giant plumes on the surface of Jupiter. Substances from its lower atmosphere rushed upwards. The process generated a tremendous amount of energy. Overheated streams of fire shot into the stratosphere. The monsters left behind them glowing plumes 1,900 miles long. That's greater than the distance between New York and Texas. 
Dark bruises appeared at the side of the blows. They were about the size of the Earth. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was the name of the violator of Jupiter's boundaries. The collision of celestial bodies happened in July 1994. It was a scientific sensation. For the first time in human history, a catastrophe of this magnitude was observed. The attack raised an important question for astronomers. Why is Jupiter unlucky? Space monsters attack it thousands of times more often than the Earth or any other planet in the solar system. Alright, let's see. You decide to board a starship and travel to the mysterious Jupiter. A space probe would need two years to get there, but your starship is faster. You'll be there in… Great, the journey only took a second. Jupiter is actually big. It could fit 1,300 Earth-sized planets in it. It looks beautiful thanks to gas clouds. This planet has no solid surface, but there's a strange stain on its surface. It looks like a huge eye that can fit three and a half Earths. This storm will scare anyone. It's 10 times higher than Everest, and the wind rushes at a speed of 300 miles per hour. It's been going on for 350 years. You wouldn't hide from such a storm in a car, so it's good you're in a starship. If all the planets of the solar system merged into one super planet, the new object would still be two and a half times smaller than Jupiter. Large size also affects gravity. Spacecraft use Jupiter as a springboard to jump. The giant's gravity increases their flight speed and helps them reach their target faster. Gravity has turned the planet into a magnet for comets, asteroids, and dangerous space debris. Jupiter is a true space superhero. Its gravity shield takes a hit and deflects space monsters that fly into the inner solar system. The dinosaurs don't agree, but more on that a little bit later. What if Jupiter was swallowed up by a giant vacuum cleaner tomorrow? I can only say one thing, we'd have huge problems. Without a giant shield, thousands of comets and asteroids are attacking the planet much more often. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere or aren't large enough to affect us. But there are also larger comets and asteroids. After their collision with the Earth, you can say goodbye to all life on the planet. For example, in 2009, a celestial body crashed into Jupiter. It left a bruise the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's scary to think what traces it would leave on our planet. Most likely, the Earth would turn into a fireball. But recent research from astronomers suggests that Jupiter isn't such a nice guy. On the contrary, it's a bad guy with a slingshot that shoots comets at the Earth. A physicist used computer simulations. He found that Jupiter is equally likely to deflect and send comets toward the Earth. The giant attracts potentially dangerous objects and only partially protects us. It's already tried to knock out our planet many times. 66 million years ago, a cosmic body 10 miles in size crashed into the Earth. The energy of the impact set the surface of the planet on fire. It caused a huge earthquake and tsunami. A fiery rain fell from the sky on the Earth. There were millions of tons of debris and dust in the atmosphere. They stopped the sun's rays from reaching the planet. The nuclear winter began. This disaster led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Scientists have named this space criminal Chicxulub Impactor. Computer simulations of scientists at Harvard University showed where it came from. Chicxulub wasn't an asteroid, but a comet. This means that the core of its body wasn't stone and metal, but ice, dust, and frozen gas. It resembled a dirty snowball flying through space. The meteorite wasn't going to set fire to the Earth, but Jupiter intervened in the plan. It threw comets in our direction. In 1770, Lexell's comet appeared near the Earth. Our planet and this object were separated by only 1.4 million miles, close to nothing in space terms. Lexell's comet came closer to Earth than any other comet in human history. The object could have stopped life on Earth. The comet flew too close to Jupiter. The giant caught it and sent it in our direction. Now this isn't a very good move for a superhero that protects the solar system. After three years, the comet went past us. It flew two times around the Sun and returned to Jupiter like a boomerang. This time, the giant pushed the comet out of the solar system. But let's not blame Jupiter. Scientists believe that without this gas giant, life on Earth would most likely never have happened. Jupiter sent meteorites toward Earth, which carried organic molecules and water with them. They were the building blocks from which earthly life began. Nobody knows if comets would come with a valuable cargo without Jupiter and its dangerous gravity. If you fly away from Earth to the center of the solar system, you'll see the Sun. Eight planets are flying around this star. There's a belt of more than one million asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. 
One theory says there was only the sun at the very beginning of the solar system's existence. Clouds of stone and dust surrounded the star. These particles attracted each other and formed planets over millions of years. Jupiter didn't want any new neighbors. Its powerful gravity prevented rocks and dust from uniting into planets. They remained asteroids and gathered in a belt inside the solar system. If today all the asteroids merged into one planet, we'd get a cosmic body that would weigh only 4% of the mass of the Moon. Previously, the belt was densely populated, but Jupiter's gravity threw 99% of the asteroids to other places in space. Jupiter isn't the only one that plays a role in the development of life on Earth. Our main assistant is the Moon. It's the only natural satellite of the Earth. Jupiter has 79 satellites, and every year there are more and more of them. Jupiter is also surrounded by rings, but they aren't as beautiful as Saturn's and are practically invisible. The rings are composed of small black particles. This is the dust that the meteorites eject into space after colliding with the moons of Jupiter. The moon is responsible for the ebb and flow of the ocean. It regulates the life of bees, fish, birds, and amphibians. Even you feel the influence of the moon every day. Changing the brightness of the disk in the night sky regulates the level of melatonin in your brain. This hormone is responsible for circadian rhythms, which are important for healthy sleep. The moon came about thanks to another catastrophe, like many other things in space. Millions of years ago, the Earth looked like a ball of hot lava. There was no water or air. It was enveloped only in carbon dioxide and nitrogen. At this time, another planet the size of modern Mars crashed into the Earth. Scientists named it Theia. At a speed of 8,900 miles per hour, it collided with the Earth. The impact of incredible force threw millions of tons of material into space. The debris gathered into a ball that became known as the Moon. Scientists have almost solved the mystery of the Moon, but they don't know if there's a solid core in the middle of Jupiter or if it's dense hot soup that hangs in space. Jupiter has the largest ocean in the solar system. It's made of liquid hydrogen, not water. If Jupiter were 80 times more massive, it would turn into a bright star. Jupiter is a unique place that will never be home to humans. The pressure inside the planet is 2 million times greater than on the surface of the Earth. Extreme pressure and temperature would ruin any spacecraft that's gone too far. I guess that means Jupiter would have a crush on you. Extremely hot and insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh wait, you mean the space thing. Okay, first, they discovered Peg 51, an exoplanet that orbits a star similar to ours. An exoplanet is any planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star that's not the Sun. This planet was completely different from anything we've ever found. Almost the same diameter as Jupiter, but half the gas giant's mass. It took only four days for this exoplanet to orbit its star, which seemed impossible. It was definitely too fast for something so massive. And then, scientists started finding something they've named hot Jupiters all over space. Lots of heated gas giants were located only a couple of million miles away from their stars. Sometimes, there were a couple of space bodies orbiting their stars pretty closely, and many were a few times bigger than Earth. Solar systems where they found hot Jupiters are not like ours. We have a neat system with smaller rocky planets on the inside and big gas giants on the outside and almost all of them peacefully orbit the Sun, following their trajectories. Everything is in order. When a star is at the earliest stage of its formation, it creates a disk of gases, debris, and dust surrounding it. It's called an accretion disk. These gases slowly get pulled into the star because of its gravitational forces, and this leads to some kind of a stellar whirlpool. The outer parts of the disk are more gas-dense than the center. With time, the whirlpool effect gets even stronger. The same thing happens with hot Jupiters, which causes these gas giants to start orbiting much faster than usual. This also carries it further toward the star in a tightening spiral. Luckily, our Jupiter didn't become a hot Jupiter. Our gas giant started its life as an icy Earth-sized asteroid, which is different from the way hot Jupiters form. During the time when it was forming, Jupiter was around four times as far from the Sun as it is today, somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. About two to three million years after Jupiter first formed in the accretion disk of our Sun, it started a 700 million year long phase astronomers call the Grand Tack. 
Now, tack is something a boat performs when going towards a buoy and then slipping past and around it. Then it speeds up and goes in the direction where it came from. That was the same thing Jupiter started doing. And in its tightening orbital migrations, the planet's gravity could have moved many asteroids and other space bodies, distorted the orbits of larger planets, and caused collisions and chaos. Jupiter's grand tack would have destroyed many big space bodies. It's a could-have-been scenario, but luckily, Jupiter changed its course and became a peaceful gas giant. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn were starting their own version of this chaotic process. Saturn even got so big that its gravity started pulling Jupiter away from its orbit. But after some time, these gas giants' orbits became locked. Then both of them managed to clear away the gases remaining between them. And since these gases were some sort of fuel for the planet's migrations, Jupiter and Saturn could both finally settle into the stable orbits we know today. Jupiter can still lob one to two icy asteroids at the inner planets from time to time. But when our planet was younger, this could have been one of the processes that formed the oceans on Earth. But Jupiter is much calmer these days. Saturn's gravitational forces have moderated the situation and are now keeping it under control. Now, Jupiter is our protector. It's two and a half times the mass of the other planets of our solar system combined. It's some sort of a gravitational shield orbiting around the inner part of the solar system. Jupiter redirects incoming debris and asteroids away from the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars – keeping us all safe. Because of this, Earth has always been protected, so our planet has had enough time to evolve complex life forms. And it hasn't been destroyed by asteroids, hot Jupiters, or other space bodies. Jupiter wasn't the only planet that could have collided with Earth. Scientists think Mercury might have been involved in a hit-and-run accident with our planet. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's the closest to the Sun and the smallest planet out there. And it also keeps getting smaller. Nowadays, its diameter is around 9 miles smaller compared to its size 4 billion years ago. Scientists think this might be happening because the planet's core is made of iron. And this iron is cooling and becoming solid, which is slowly reducing the planet's size. Mercury is the planet with the biggest number of craters in our solar system. Its atmosphere is really thin, so it can do nothing to keep the planet protected from meteors. The largest crater on Mercury's surface is at least 963 miles across. It could fit Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The object that formed such a crater must have been at least 62 miles long. With all these craters, Mercury looks similar to our moon. It orbits the Sun faster than the other planets, so one year on Mercury lasts around 88 Earth days. That means celebrating a birthday every three months or even more often. At the same time, the planet rotates so slowly that a day on Mercury lasts almost 59 Earth days. A long time to wait to go to bed. There's a piece of Mercury on our planet. In 2012, a green meteorite was found at a street market in Morocco. Scientists studied its composition and concluded it could be from Mercury. Mercury doesn't have its own moons because of its small size and weak gravity. Plus, the planet is too close to the Sun. By the way, the only other planet without moons in our solar system is Venus. Mercury has a really thin crust, like a good pizza. <laughs> One of the theories of the planet's formation claims there was a major collision where the planet lost most of its crust. It could have also moved Mercury from its original spot. It wouldn't be unusual. The gas giants in our solar system also didn't form in the location where they are today. Mercury also has an eccentric orbit, which means it could have been kicked out of its old orbit and moved to a new one. Scientists also think Mercury might have collided with the early Earth. One theory says that's how the moon could be formed. Out of all the material flying away after the big crash, there might even have been pieces of Mercury's crust in the mix. Exoplanets Kepler-107b and Kepler-107c are a pair of planets that orbit a star similar to our Sun in the Kepler-107 system. It's around 1,700 light-years away from us. These planets have almost identical sizes, both with a radius one and a half times that of Earth. But one of them, Kepler-107c, is almost three times as dense as the other. That's because the planets have a different composition. 
Some scientists believe that Kepler-107b is less dense because it probably collided with another unknown planet in the past. This powerful hit took away part of its surface and left behind a very dense core rich in iron. A huge comet hit Neptune around 200 years ago. But since Neptune isn't a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, like Mars or Mercury, it's harder to find evidence of this impact. But a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke apart in 1994 and smashed into Jupiter. Astronomers managed to record this event. It helped them learn more about the elements and molecules the collisions left in Jupiter's atmosphere. This information helped scientists realize that the amount of carbon monoxide in the upper layers of Neptune's atmosphere is higher than in the lower ones. This means a big comet likely hit the planet in the past, since comets have carbon monoxide in their icy tails. Something huge slammed into Uranus, too, changing the planet forever. A space object twice bigger than Earth hit the ice giant. This left the planet tilted, and it looks as if it's rotating on its side. Uranus is extremely cold, way colder than it's supposed to be. It might mean that the object that slammed into it was probably a young protoplanet made up of ice and rocks. Also, some of the debris from that collision may have created a thin shell around Uranus. It still traps the heat coming from the core of the planet. There are strange energy pulses bombarding our entire galaxy. And they come from the other side of the universe. Over the last decade, scientists have been observing bizarre flashes of light coming toward our planet. This phenomenon is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These signals travel through a couple of billion light years of dust and gas. That's a rather long way. So far, no one has figured out what's going on behind these bursts. The fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth was related to a hurricane gust. On April 10, 1996, tropical cyclone Olivia was passing by Barrow Island, Western Australia. At one moment, the storm reached the speed of a Category 4 hurricane, 254 miles per hour. That's faster than a Formula One racing car. You can probably imagine how much damage this kind of wind can cause. The only windstorm faster than that is a tornado. The air inside a whirlwind can move at a speed of 300 miles per hour. Unfortunately, there's no sure way to measure tornadic winds. Weather instruments never survived the experience. Oh, and licking your finger and sticking it up in the wind to measure speed also isn't a good idea here, unless you don't mind losing your arm, or worse. Here are some more numbers. 35 miles per hour and more, that's the speed of the average blizzard. 50 to 60 miles per hour, that's how fast a severe thunderstorm moves. More than 74 miles per hour is the speed of a powerful tropical hurricane. Up to 400 miles per hour? Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but you need to travel to Jupiter to see a storm that speedy. The Great Red Spot is an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the surrounding cloud tops. The storm's almost three times as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that the monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But since these measurements were most likely imprecise, the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere and Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in its upper cloud layers. The closer it is to the core, the hotter it gets. But the highest temperatures ever recorded on the planet were in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat can reach 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than lava on our planet. The storm's extreme conditions and turbulence produce gravitational and sound waves. These waves might be responsible for the superheating. The storm itself is also warmer at its bottom than at the top. If you found yourself at its center, you wouldn't be too impressed. But on the edges, the wind speed reaches 300 to 420 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. Now, this will help you picture the immense force of such winds. On Earth, the wind doesn't have to be faster than 60 miles per hour to lift a person as heavy as 170 pounds from the ground. 
A wind as fast as 75 miles per hour can uproot large trees, peel off roofs, break windows, and turn over mobile homes. When the wind speed reaches 150, it can send cars flying. Now picture the havoc a storm as powerful as the Great Red Spot can cause on our planet. But could such an enormous anticyclone occur on Earth? Luckily, not. Our planet doesn't have the unique conditions needed for the storm to form. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. And it was mostly the fault of the storm's home planet. It's more than a thousand times larger than Earth and over 300 times as massive. Jupiter is a gas giant, which means it consists mostly of fill in the blank. Around the planet's core, there's an ocean of liquid hydrogen. And the atmosphere is also mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. That means Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, the only thing that could make the storm weaken. Without any friction, the storm has already been churning for centuries. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, and swirling. Just like on our planet, when cooler and hotter gases mix and merge into one another, they form giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms came together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps raging by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, this monster of a storm absorbs other smaller vortices. They make the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow people to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Astronomers have been speculating on what may lie beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Could it be a massive volcano? Unlikely. Jupiter's mostly gas. That's why it doesn't have a crust that could crack and release scorching hot stuff from the planet's interior. Several theories try to explain why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of ammonium hydrosulfide might be reacting with cosmic rays or the UV radiation coming from the sun. This somehow gives the spot its pretty red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Astronomers have been observing the Great Red Spot since the 1830s, and for the first time, the storm was spotted in 1665 and described as the permanent spot. In other words, the storm is almost 400 years old. Strangely, it's been shrinking in size since the beginning of the 21st century. In 2019, it began flaking at the edges, with smaller pieces breaking off and vanishing. If this process continues, by 2040, the Great Red Spot will become circular or it may disappear altogether. The storm isn't only getting smaller, it's also growing taller and getting a more intense orange hue. It's not completely clear why it's happening. Might be because of a chemical reaction. It occurs when some new material rises to the top layers of the atmosphere from below. The Great Red Spot might be the most famous storm in the solar system, but it's by no means the only one. Even on Jupiter, there's a bit less known Little Red Spot. One more anticyclone, but smaller in size. Well, when I say smaller, I mean the thing's not as large as its big sister. But it's still about the size of Earth. Recently, the highest wind speed inside the Little Red Spot has increased up to 400 miles per hour. A storm as wide as our planet rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so, when Saturn's northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. This storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it stretches in length. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the peak of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White it's where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal heat source that can power the winds. 
great dark spots on Neptune are massive storms that form in areas with high atmospheric pressure. That's different on Earth. Here, storms appear when the pressure is low. Around the spot's edges, the wind speeds can reach 1,300 miles per hour. Astronomers have observed six dark spots on Neptune so far. These powerful storms get born deep in the planet's atmosphere. And the darker a storm is, the brighter the methane clouds around it are. Another monster-sized storm raging on Saturn looks pretty much like a hurricane or typhoon on our planet. It has an eye and spiraling clouds surrounding it. But compared to Earth's hurricanes, the one on the ring planet is titanic. On Saturn, the eye of the storm is up to 1,250 miles across. The bright clouds closer to the edges of the hurricane are moving at a speed of 330 miles per hour. But one of the most unusual things about this storm is its shape. It has six sides and is known as the hexagon. When astronomers saw the first images with the vortex, they did a double take. The thing was just too similar to our storms. And still, the one whirling on Saturn has an eye that's almost 20 times larger than any people have seen on Earth. The storm also moves four times faster than hurricane winds on our planet. Saturn's atmosphere has little water vapor. How the bizarre hexagon storm is getting by in such conditions is a mystery. Plus, unlike the constantly drifting hurricanes on Earth, the one on Saturn seems to have nowhere to go. For some inexplicable reason, it's stuck at the planet's North Pole. You're on a plane heading to an important astronomy convention when you see a large figure outside your window that eclipses the whole sun. You spit out all of your coffee, and everyone in the plane stares outside in shock. You then notice that it has rings like Saturn. You were supposed to fly to Japan, but you're forced to land in California. As soon as you land, you look up in the sky and see some more giant planet-like structures floating around in the sky. Everyone is taking pictures and trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, you notice a huge ball of fire crashing down near the airport. Everyone scrambles for safety, and luckily, it ends up in the middle of the runway with no one around. The bad news is, there's no more runway for planes to land. Everyone huddles together for safety, and more large objects appear in the sky. All communications have ceased or broken down, since these large objects have ruined all the satellites. Some scientists nearby mention that these objects are the planets of the solar system going within the same proximity as our moon. Mercury and Venus look like moons, but Saturn is occupying a lot of sky real estate. You tell those scientists that you're an astronomer. They invite you to join them on a trip to Antarctica to the observatory station in the South Pole. They need every mind to help solve this mystery. You get on a ship with the coordinates set to Antarctica. The waves are extremely rough for typical daylight and non-stormy weather. You finally make it to the shore of the continent after a few days and have to get in a snowmobile all the way to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Over here, you and a group of scientists will figure out what's going on. You weren't prepared for the freezing temperatures, even though it's July. You arrive at the station and see all your fellow scientists running around with paperwork and blurting out stuff about planets orbiting our atmosphere. You arrive at the conference room, where the lead scientist explains what's going on. One by one, the planets are coming closer to us until they're aligned with the moon, but they still don't know why and how. Venus arrived first, and now Saturn is getting closer. The moon is around 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it affects the tides of the oceans and seas with its gravitational pull. Since water is less dense than land, we can see the tides change. So high tides occur when the Earth is pulled towards the moon. And since the other planets are coming closer to Earth, the gravitational pull is erratically changing. In a couple of hours, Saturn will be in the same distance as our moon. You head to the large telescope and observe the planets. Any plane or helicopter won't fly properly and won't have the proper radar technology to help it. You keep observing and notice Mars getting closer to Earth. You get news that tidal waves are rising very often now, 
and some island nations are even being washed away. Good thing they got evacuated beforehand. With Mars closing in, you notice Neptune also getting closer. You can feel the gravity on Earth fluctuate with every step you take. You report your findings to the lead scientist, and the only way for survival is to quickly build bunkers far away from oceans and seas that can host many people before the other planets close in. A team of engineers arrive and start building. Wave after wave of survivors come and settle into the bunkers, practically built overnight. With every hour, more planets are getting closer. Mars and Neptune have already settled in with Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Pluto and Uranus are now visible to the unaided eye and are making their way towards Earth. The gravitational pull is getting completely out of hand. The snow in the Antarctic desert remains floating for several seconds whenever someone walks on it. You can jump a lot higher. It's now nighttime, but the sky isn't dark as usual. The planets are reflecting a lot more sunlight than our moon. It's barely visible now. With more observations, you notice comets and meteorites flying very close to our atmosphere. Some are even crashing down on Mars and Neptune. Everyone can see it from Earth. Other space debris also finds its way into Earth's atmosphere. But you notice something strange. The planets are now orbiting Saturn. You check your calculations and find out that the planet's positions are now aligned with Saturn's orbit. That's because it has the biggest mass among all the planets. Saturn's rings are made up of ice particles, some as large as a bus and others as tiny as pebbles. But they're all crashing and interfering with the other planets. No one can feel the orbit shift at first, but later you can start to feel it. With this happening, earthquakes and volcanoes are bound to happen. This is why everyone, including yourself, is packing up and ready to flee. Antarctica has dozens of volcanoes hidden beneath the frozen ice. Some are underground, while some are right on top. Saturn's gravitational pull is much stronger than Earth's gravitational pull on the moon. This will cause the inner core to react a lot more and kickstart those earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Everyone packs up super quick and heads to the choppers to fly to South Africa. These choppers were designed to have a direct course without the need for radars to guide them. You arrive in South Africa, which is mainly covered in water. The chopper takes you closer to the center, and then you travel to the Sahara Desert. The plain surface with nothing around it will be the best option for safety. But you look up in the sky and see another planet closing in. It's Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. If Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. It's approaching quickly. Many of the other planets automatically make way for it, including Saturn. You're on the road heading to the Sahara, even though it'll take days to reach by car. The sky is dark during the day, since most planets are blocking the sun. You finally make it to the Sahara Desert with other scientists. And to your surprise, a whole city was erected in just a month when the planets started showing up. You settle in your dorm, but still have a lot of work to do. A couple of days later, Jupiter breaches the atmosphere and completely eclipses us. But Earth is now rotating around it. And it's much quicker than orbiting the Sun, since Jupiter is smaller. But since Saturn is also big, Earth keeps getting tossed from orbit to orbit, like two people playing a ball game with each other. So with that happening, people on Earth are experiencing different gravitational pulls from time to time. The tidal waves keep getting stronger and volcanoes are erupting everywhere. Since the Earth's core is getting hotter, the temperature on Earth is also changing. And with a lack of sunlight most of the time, much of the plant life is having a hard time trying to keep up. Crops are harder to plant with natural sunlight, so people are turning to artificial lighting and greenhouses. Air and space travel are impossible. The International Space Station is completely ruined, along with the satellites orbiting space. That's why cell phones and the internet can't work. Gravity is even more dysfunctional than ever. Six months later, humanity has found some way of coping with the new normal. But things are constantly being updated. The number of hours in a day has changed, as well as days that compose a week. This used to be measured with the moon phases, a month used to be the moon achieving all phases from none to full moon, and so on. 
but Earth's moon has disappeared with the cluttered, disorganized planets. 